go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Do that again. Welcome back to Containers on the Couch. <laughs> That's better. It happens when you take your thing off mute is much a lot easier. Um, welcome back to Containers from another episode from Containers on the Couch. We're back again, finally with people with audio like myself and um, two amazing guests. We're going to be talking to us about Finch, which we've spoken about before, but we're going to be doing something new about Finch. So, um, Ollie, can you please introduce yourself for those who don't know you, and then we'll go over to Justin. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Ollie Pomeroy. Uh, I'm a developer advocate here at AWS as part of the container services team. And I work on a, a variety of different things um, in the container runtime, uh, container development, and Fargate space. And Justin, please introduce yourself hey. to let everybody know where you are, who you are, what you do. Yeah, good to be here. I'm going to have to get that intro music for later. Um, uh... <laughs> Yeah, I'm a, I'm a uh, software developer here at AWS on the containers team. Uh, spending a lot of time working on Finch for the last, uh, well, since it came out, basically. And uh, we've got a cool new feature to talk about today. Awesome. And my name is Mishailo Casing. I'm also a developer advocate on the ECS service team. Um, we're here on Containers on the Couch every Thursday, same time, uh, same day. And for everybody who's joining us in the chat, say hello. Um, let us know where you're joining from. If you've heard about Finch before, are you using it? We'd love to hear your comments. And um, Ollie or Justin, whoever would like to start, tell us. I remember we did a, a couple of episodes before about Finch. I'll try and find the link and pop it in the in the chat in a minute. But give us a quick overview. What is Finch and why why would people use it? Yeah, yeah, happy, happy to. So um, Finch is a tool that you can install on your developer workstation to help you build applications in containers locally. Um, so Finch was, was released, uh, I guess, originally open sourced back in 2022, in, in the autumn or the fall of 2022. Um, and at that time, it uh, was available for developers who use Mac OS. Um, and it, Finch basically helps to solve the problem of I'm developing for a production Linux environment. I'm developing um, for uh, Linux containers in the cloud, but I need to have a Linux environment locally to create those containers, to package up my applications, to test that it all works. Um, and so what we do is, is we go and grab loads of the, the open source container tools, uh, package them all up, bundle them, make them really easy to install and upgrade and run on your developer machine. Um, and so we did that first for, for Mac OS developers. So we had a nice seamless experience to run a, a Linux environment on Mac OS. Um, then back in the autumn of 2023, so the fall 2023, a few months ago, we, we had a big milestone. We hit our general availability, our, our 1.0 release. And that's when we were, were really kind of happy with the progress we've made in, in the first year and, and so all the big features were there. And um, today here, we're, we're, we're talking about the, the next big release we've had on the Finch side, which is bringing Finch to developers who use Windows workstations and providing a Linux development environment for those that, that use Windows as their daily machine. OK, cool. So. What is the actual, what did we announce? We announced the fact we were supporting it. And I assume that it was not the same thing as just, okay, building another binary that we needed to do that was simple, which we did for. Um, so let's go a little bit more into the details and say what we actually, where people can find more information about the actual launch, what we did and how this actually works. Yeah, sure, ha happy to. And actually what I'll do is I will um, bring up the, the launch blog and we can, we can circulate them there. And the link in, in the chat. So yeah. this is this was the the launch. This is what we announced. Um, 
for those that had been following the GitHub repository, and we know a few people out there in the community had been, they, they've, they've known that we've been developing on this for a little while. And it finally went uh, generally available on the 1st of February. This is when we released the, uh, the MSI installer. And so this here is the announcement of what's new post and and Phil and, and Justin on this call released a, a, a blog to launch protocol alongside it. And, and this is, is us announcing to the world that we have we have, have Finch for Windows. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Mesh, to take your question, um, it wasn't as simple as packaging a new binary, unfortunately, um, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, so there were a lot of challenges, which you can read about in this blog post in more detail, but um, the biggest one is our mechanism for providing this Linux environment that Ollie was talking about is completely different on, on Windows uh, than it is on Mac OS. Um, so I, I, maybe I should save the details for later, but um, that was probably the biggest, the most development work which we had to do um, to, to get Windows support out the door. Okay. But correct me if I'm wrong, essentially when we are running this kind of tool, the same thing I remember when we were using Docker as a Docker desktop and also Finch, essentially what you're doing is you're running a virtual machine on your physical laptop or desktop. And that machine is either running Linux on it or something else. Um, in this case, Windows depends on what you were doing. And from there, you're building your Docker as if you were running in a physical machine natively. So I gather, we're going to hear in a few seconds what the challenges were about running that difference, what the difference are between the um, way we do it on um, Mac and the way we do it on Windows. So, Ali, what can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I, I guess I'll, I'll start on, on on a quick high level. Uh, this one. Um, oh, no, I don't even have it open. I'll jump to runfinch.com, which is the, the documentation page. And um, on here, we have, have documentation on how to get started with Finch, how to install it, and, and how to, um, to, to play around with containers using Finch. But I think this, this architecture diagram, and those who would have watched some of my previous uh, containers from the couch appearances would have seen the macOS version of this. Um, it, it basically talks through the tools that we use to create that Linux environment. So um, the idea being that that Finch is is a command line tool that lives on the in this on the host or on this in the Windows environment, and then through a hypervisor, um, we were able to then run a Linux kernel, a Linux environment, and then run a subset of those container tools in that Linux environment, um, and so. With Finch, we have chosen to, to package up and distribute uh, container D as the container runtime, uh, build kit as the tool to create those container images. Uh, there's some CNI plugins in there to wire the containers together for, for container to container communication. Um, and we lean heavily on this, this nerd CTL or, or nerd cuttle tool to, to do the starting and the stopping of the, of the containers. But all of that is running in the Linux environment, and that's that's kind of what you get with Finch is the fact that we handle all that Linux environment for you. you. You don't have to worry about packaging those things, installing them, configuring them, even supporting them. That's that's all provided by us. Um, this diagram looks very similar on the macOS side. The only, I guess, or well, the big difference for Windows between the two is that hypervisor layer. And uh, I guess I'm going to hand over to Justin now to kind of talk about what this this green Lima box is and what what WSL2 is and why we use that on on Finch on Windows. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Finch in general uses something called Lima to manage all of these virtual machine configurations, basically provisioning, deprovisioning, installing tools, etc. Um, Lima itself is an open source project um, created by one of the maintainers uh, for ContainerD. Um, and since Finch on macOS already used Lima, 
Um, we figured that the best way to get Windows support into Finch would be to contribute not to not to not add that to Finch directly, but to contribute it to Lima. Um, so Lima has this concept of virtual machine drivers. And um, since, uh, like I said, there was already a, a QME virtual machine driver, which worked on Mac OS, which you can see in all these diagram for Mac OS. There were a couple other virtual machine drivers, again, specific to Mac OS or Linux, but there was not one for Windows yet. So um, the first step of adding support uh, Windows support to Finch was actually contributing a WSL2 VM driver to Lima. And what that did for us is it allowed us to not have to make many modifications to Finch itself. Instead, we made a lot of uh, modifications to Lima and then our code path in Finch stayed very fairly similar. There were some challenges there as well, uh, particularly with paths and things like that. But um, it, it remained fairly similar. Um, and the added benefit was Anyone else that also used Lima now has a VM driver for WSL2. Um, and as you can see in the diagram, there are differences between WSL2 and QMU. Um, WSL2 itself is kind of like a VM. Um, like there's kind of like two layers of VM virtual machines here, I guess you could say, or containers really. Um, and there's really one shared kernel between all of your WSL2 instances of which Lima, uh, Finch is reusing one of them. So that itself adds more challenges and, and, and difficult, uh, not difficulties, but um, things to consider uh, when we're talking about Finch on Windows. So one, one second, and let me just get this correct. You mean when I, I as I said, I was going to say at the beginning of the show when we were offline, I said I'm going to laugh a bit at Windows because I haven't used it a lot, but still. I've been using a Mac completely exclusively for the past almost 10 years, but still, I do remember Windows, the fact when we had WSL was the fact that you're telling me you can run multiple WSL environments on your Windows machine? Yeah, that's right. Um, so Finch <laughs> has one instance called Lima Finch right now. Um, we, maybe we'll disambiguate it later in case you have multiple Finch instances or things like that. But um, it's 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 an instance specifically uh, to to run all of these tools: NerdCuddle, BuildKit, Containerd, and things like that. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and just to kind of back up a little bit, so, so WSL is is Windows subsystem for Linux, and this is a feature of Windows that, that Microsoft create and, and release. They had Windows subsystem for Linux version one back in 2016, I think, and then in 2019, they released Windows subsystem for Linux two. Um, the, the big difference between those two things, in, in, in version one, there was no Linux kernel and Microsoft was basically a translation layer between a Linux application um, and it would translate the system calls to work with a, a Windows kernel. In 2019 in WSL2, they, they redid their architecture a little bit and now Microsoft distribute and package a Linux kernel. Uh, it actually gets updated through Windows Update, which is, which is I always find quite funny really. Mind blowing. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so this is like a, a native Windows feature. It's a built-in hypervisor that, oh, sorry, it leverages a built-in hypervisor. It, it's kind of a seamless experience to run these Linux virtual machines on a on a Windows workstation. And and as Justin said, we we've just, we've leveraged Windows Subsystem for Linux or WSL to then provide us an environment to run containers. And we've done all of that plumbing from Finch to the distribution and back again. Yeah, um, and just to um, also take a step back here, um, there are other options for a virtual a virtual machine on Windows. Um, so the reason why we chose WSL2, uh, and Ollie kind of hinted towards it, it is like officially supported by Microsoft and um, it doesn't require us to package or build or distribute any other external software like QMU or whatever it may be. Um, so uh, that, that was one reason. Um, another reason is that um, it's easily installable. So um, anyone with pretty much any version of Windows, as long as it's a modern version of Windows, so what, by that I mean like the latest version of Windows 10 or Windows 11, um, you can just run a quick command in your terminal and install WSL2 just like that. Um, so 
the, the fact that it runs on any version of Windows pretty much and that we don't have to worry about packaging, distributing, patching, um, all of that um, distinguishes it from things like QMU and also from Hyper-V itself, which is the hypervisor that Ollie was hinting at that's built into Windows. Um, Hyper-V is a more fully functioned hypervisor for managing these VMs. However, it's not available on every version of Windows like WSL2 is. So there were there is discussion um, when merging the PR into Lima about this as well. And that's really why WSL2 uh, wins out, in, in our opinion, compared to um, these other options that I was just discussing. And for anybody who's interested in looking, this is actually the PRF of one I can finally copy paste in my, my terminal. I'll put it here in the chat as well. You can see the actual PR where we merge the support for Lima as well. Indeed, and, and and so Lima, that Linux virtual machines project, it's it's used by a variety of different tools in the container ecosystem. So the, the, one of the, the things we wanted to do on, on the Finch side is, is, is be a good citizen. So when Justin was working on this, putting it back into Lima means any consumer of Lima uh, can can have a, a WSL2 variant of their product. That's part of being open source, exactly. Indeed. Um, I, I guess maybe it might help just kind of showcasing what, what Finch on Windows would look like. Would that be good? Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Awesome, cool. Uh, okay, so um, for those that, that haven't seen, Finch is 100% is open source. That it's, it's available uh, at runfinch slash finch is the, the GitHub repository. So everything that we're, we're kind of using here is an open source project. Um, you can get support for Finch through the community, but it is actually also a, a project that's supported by AWS. So if you're a uh, if you have a support contract with AWS, you can actually raise tickets for Finch, and, and, and the team will look at them. Um, but if you go onto the Finch releases page, this is where you'll be able to find um, the that installer. So as well as having these these macOS packages, you now have the MSI, which yeah. is which is what you need to install Finch on Windows. Um, and once once you have that, you are uh, you are ready to go. So if I now open up um, Microsoft Terminal and uh, a PowerShell session, I'm going to quickly hide that. Um, you you can then start to interact with Finch. Finch right now is uh, is, is a CLI tool, so everything I'll do here is in the CLI. Um, I guess some. Um, I guess uh, to, to show what what's actually happening under, under the, underneath. So. Uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux also has a CLI, and if I do like WSL list, uh, you can see that right now I only have one distribution, and that distribution is is an Ubuntu distribution, and this is just a um, an environment that I, I use to develop in. If I now do Finch VM in it, and that's initializing a, fin a Finch environment. That is is the first thing you need to do, or the only thing you really need to do, to create a Linux environment to run containers. Okay. Through through that Lima that plugin that Lima driver, um, we're then communicating with WSL2, creating an environment that that is ready to run run containers. And I assume, and I probably remember asking this also in the regular feature, we have defaults which we provide for the size of the virtual machine, how many virtual CPUs, how much RAM we're allocating, how much disk space we're allocating, and I assume those things could also be modified if need, if we need to, correct? Yeah, um, maybe I can take that. So WSL2, like I mentioned, has like a root VM, you can think of it, that's shared between all of these instances that, that you might see when Ali runs um, the list command. So because of that, then, while Finch does have settings for that on Mac OS, on Windows, we don't really want to modify the global settings for you. So on the runfinch.com okay. website, we do have instructions on these more advanced settings, which you can use, um, which again, will apply to all of your instances, but we don't actually um, get in the business of modifying them for you, at least not right now. Uh, uh, yeah, and I also say like the WSL is a more fluid environment than something like KMU or even Hyper-V in terms of the resources it uses. It just kind of said like grows and shrinks. It's it's less fixed in terms of like hard allocating resources. Okay. 
Um, that was pretty quick, by the way, to create the machine from what I see. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, lots kind of went on behind the scenes that you didn't see there in terms of us uh, creating the distribution from our machine image and, and, and starting all of the container tools. One of the, um, so if I now do the WSL list command, you should see now that I have Lima Finch as a, as a distribution, it's running. I now have an environment of all my container tools so that that container D, nerd CTL, build kit stack that we talked about, ready to go. And in theory, you, you, you don't need to touch this distribution now. You, you now can do everything to, to build or run containers from, from here. Like you don't actually have to enter that distribution. You, you can if you're curious to see what's see how the sausage is made, but you you don't you don't have to. Okay. Um, and then one of the other interesting things actually was in that first log line item, is is where it says here we're attaching a disk to it, and one of the uh, I guess I guess one of the the user requests or, or one of the common features people have with this is they want to persist their container images and their containers between upgrades, between installs, things like that. And so what we're doing here is we're attaching a persistent disk where we'll store all of our container files. So um, I actually had this VM initialized earlier this afternoon and I was using it to run around some things. So now if I did like a finch image list command, I actually already have images in my distribution because you know, I've, I've, I, we persist container data, and you can then you can then use it between upgrades and, and between installs and stuff like that. Um, so, so that's that's kind of how we we have this uh, environment. You, you're now ready to go. So you, you saw me run image list. This, any um, commands you're familiar with to interact with containers, so like like a ps or an image list or a run or a build will just work here. And we're handling the plumbing to go from your Windows host, which is where, where I'm running now, I'm running in PowerShell, through into that WSL2 distribution and executing your containers. So like for, I guess, for, for those who are curious, if you did like, um, like this Finch run and like just did like Finch run Nginx, what that's actually doing behind the scenes is now starting that container on the other distributions. And that did not okay. very well. But the, the idea is that's that's kind of what's, what's happening. Good good with Perfect. that. Yeah. Um, it's fine. Um, so that's that's kind of what's what's happening. Um, we also take advantage of like some of the things users would expect from a like a development environment perspective so if you're um, I guess I guess a common example would be if you had the source code of your application locally you want to mount that into a container when you're working in that container um, or if you were exposing a web server in the container you want to be able to access that on the host uh, we've done all of that wiring up as well so um, like a common, or I guess a demonstration example here, uh, if if I look in, I have a very simple Flask application that's based on Python here. And um, if, I, if I build it and I run it inside of Finch, what we're able to do is we're able to like build the container image and this with like a Finch build, and we're able to run it and mount the volumes from the local Windows host into the Linux container and 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 handle all of that mapping. So you don't have to, even though there's a whole virtualization layer going on here, you just don't have to think about it, <laughs> which, awesome. is, which is a nice little advantage. And while this is building, there was an op a question which I have no idea what the person, I don't know what this actually means, but hopefully you, Justin, do, which came from Inspector the Amateur. Can I have a 9p2000.l root FS and not have any virtual drives? I'm not sure yeah, if you understand the question. I'm not quite sure uh, what to get from that question. Uh, if you could explain more in chat, maybe we can uh, revisit that. Clarify, yeah. It'll be better if you could please inspect the diameter. Um, cool. And then just, just to and show the- In case your container's running, yeah. 
yeah, the final part that you, you can do a publish, and so I can now hit 8080 in a browser. And I've also just mounted in the volume, so my local Windows environment is now in the container, and it should all be 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 nice and seamless. So if I uh, opened up a terminal and and went to localhost and 8080, you can see the picture of the Finch logo, which is this bird. That's absolutely fine. And if I went into my application and I changed the logo from Finch to let's say ECS, and I go back, like it should all work pretty natively. There is like that. It just shows port forwarding file mounts all work. You. As, as a developer, you can just carry on writing your code in your IDE, and you don't have to think about this WSL2 Linux distribution and this list of, of container tools. So and let's go back to the question, I think, with that Inspector Diamond asked, but he was talking about the fact of a clean file sharing with the host. So that's what you're talking about now, that you do have, because of the Lima driver, you can share into the virtual machine itself, which is running on a VHD, in this case, on some kind of hypervisor on the Windows the files which are actually running into the container itself, correct? Yeah, uh, so the file sharing, uh, file sharing is actually a native feature of WSL2. Um, all of your Windows files are available under a special mount path automatically. Um, the virtual drive that we were talking about is just to store your container metadata. So um, the list of images that you have that you have pulled already, the list of containers that you've run in the past or created rather, um, maybe whatever networks you've created, volumes, things like that. Um, so the virtual drive, uh, really what it is, if Ollie goes to the path, you'll see is just a file on your Windows um, hardware, like uh, your Windows um, root file system rather. Um, okay. And the, like I said, the file sharing is automatic. So there's not really a need or a way to um, use QM use file sharing with WSL2, uh, I guess, at this point. Maybe maybe that's something they're thinking about in the future, but there's no way to do that um, right now. I hope that answers the question. I, I think it does. There was one more question, which actually brings me to another thing, which I remember once upon a time from the olden days. when. Docker was starting out or um, containers were starting out on Windows. You could either build a Windows container on a Windows machine. And if you needed to build a Linux machine, you couldn't do that on a Windows thing or you needed a different kind of, um, I can't remember exactly what you needed to do to play around with that. What is the state today with Finch? Can you build also Windows containers images and Linux images? Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. So there's, um... Finch itself today is uh, Linux containers on Windows. So we're not running or building Windows containers against the host's Windows kernel. And we're not managing a container runtime on the Windows host. We're only running um, Linux containers in a managed WSL2 distribution on top okay. of WSL2. So like that's that's kind of where Finch is playing, um, and we, we can talk a little bit about futures and roadmap later on. But we we kind of thought that was where the main like the, the main use case for 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 Finch on Windows right now. But if if people want to see Finch making Windows containers, we're happy happy to talk about it. And just refresh my memory: if somebody would like to build, what is the process of building a Windows container? If somebody wanted to build a .NET or um, uh, Windows Core VM or container image? How would they do that on a Windows on a Windows machine? Um, at that point, you'd need to run a container runtime like on the host itself. So the Docker engine can run on Windows. And I think BuildKit can as well separately, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But yeah, you, okay. would, you would run the Docker engine like natively, so if you if you've used Docker Desktop before or on Windows Server, you can just run Docker Engine and you can use that as an environment to build Windows containers. Yeah, okay. I think Containerd also runs on Windows these days. Um, but really, um, if, I think most people would build a .NET app even uh, to run on Linux in production. On Linux, um, exactly. That's what I would, I would definitely suggest you do that exactly, not on Windows. Yeah. 
even a .NET app, .NET Core app, for example, I think most people are distributing it um, as a Linux container or just running it on Linux. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I have a quick uh, question for 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 all of you. Um, when developing this feature, this is kind of getting a bit of a back, back, back behind the curtains. Of course, we use the cloud. And um, for the people, before I go into that, let me just firstly say welcome to everybody who's joining in the middle of the show. We're talking about Finch release on Windows. If you've joined us now, um, I'm here with Justin and with Ollie. And the question that I wanted to get to was the fact, if I remember correctly, on an EC2 instance today, you cannot run a virtual machine because it's already one layer of virtualization running underneath. In other words, the, the EC2 instance is running on some kind of a hypervisor on a physical server somewhere in the cloud or in one of the regions. So how do you, besides having the fact of developing on physically on a Windows laptop, which I hope is not the case for everybody who wants to do it because doing CICD on somebody's laptop is not a good idea. So how did you go about doing this? Did you use any tools with inside the cloud in order to actually do the development of this feature using Windows? Yeah, um, I guess I can take that. Uh, so luckily, uh, what you said about EC2 is true in general. Um, they are, the instances you get are, you know, virtual machines themselves already and nested virtualization is disabled. Um, so that means you can't run a virtual machine inside of a virtual machine. Um, that doesn't have to be the case, but that is the case for EC2 and most, you know, cloud providers. Um, so because of that, um, EC2 actually has this feature called bare metal instances, um, okay. which essentially gives you the entire machine without a virtualization, virtualization layer. Um, and with that, you can run a Windows uh, server um, AMI, uh, so Amazon Machine Image, on the EC2 uh, instance. And EC, uh, Windows Server 2022 specifically, um, it's possible to install WSL2 and that's how I personally did most of my development uh, on Lima and on Finch. Um, and since you brought up CICD, um, that's also what we're using uh, basically for our CICD pipeline on the Finch GitHub repo. Um, so if you were to go and check um, Finch GitHub repo, you'll notice on every merged um, commit and on every PR, we have some workflows that run. And um, a couple of those are actually testing Windows features, um, or testing features on Windows, rather. Um, so those also run on um, bare metal EC2 instances that we've provisioned. Um, I think GitHub has some um, native runners now that, that you actually can use for this as well. I think they're called like large runners or something like that. Um, okay. But we did all of our development before that feature was even available. Maybe we'll switch to that in the future. But yeah, EC2 bare metal instances with Windows servers um, Kind of the best way to do it uh, right now, and that does pose challenges though, um, because Windows Server is not Windows 11; it's not Windows 10, so they're kind of out of sync with some features, which is why having a physical machine will always help uh, with this type of development. But um, hopefully, as we go forward and maybe a new Windows Server release comes out, these types of things uh, become less uh, less of an issue. And Inspector Diamond actually asked a question, which I think I know the answer for, but I'm going to take us to a different level. So for example, are the VMs IBM PC compatible? So I assume the actual VHDX or the virtual the WSL environment we are running, are they compatible to run to another machine? So instead of saying, are they compatible? For example, if I wanted to take that environment from my current Windows laptop and move it over to another Windows laptop, would that be something I can do in the WSL environment? So technically, yes. Um, so it's very abstracted and very hidden away, but all WSL2 VMs are themselves VHDX files. Uh, so okay. if you were to export that file or even just stop your VM and copy it over, um, and I guess you would also need the um, persistent data volume uh, that, we, that yep. we were talking about. If you don't care about your containers, your, your metadata, maybe you don't need it. But if you were to copy over at least the root volume um, and import it on a different machine, it should work. Um, there's not really a reason why it wouldn't work. 
Um, would it work with Finch? Maybe not, but you could probably get it to boot on Hyper-V or WSL2 if you really wanted to. That's a challenge for some of our guests, or only if you want to try it and see if that works, let us know. We'd love to hear. Yeah. I, actually, another thing to point out there, though, if you only cared about the container data, you could just copy your persistent volume over, and that would work. Um, okay. But uh, with Finch, um, but if uh, but that's not like a feature that we you know endorse or support. But technically, it's possible. <laughs> okay, it's a good question. Cool. And, and that reminded me of one thing I was about to say. So so um, container images are tied to their architecture. By that I mean if you like build, well, traditionally, if you built a container image on an x86 processor, you would have to run that container image on an x86 server. And then uh, kind of vice versa, if you wanted to build for an ARM64 server, so like a, a Graviton server, you'd have to build on a um, ARM machine. One of the things that we have been able to do in Finch is do some levels of emulation. So you can run for other architectures. So you could build or run containers. And I, I haven't actually tested this recently, but we'll try. We'll see how it goes. Um, but if you if you run uh, like Finch with a platform flag, you can actually emulate other architectures for uh, like for, for testing or for building. And I, I hope this works. We'll see. <laughs> um, but here I'm, I'm basically emulating an ARM64 environment for this particular container image. And so if uh, I'm now on my x86 laptop, and what do I have? There we go. I have an ARM container image, an ARM64 container image running. So you can have this idea of if you wanted to build for an alternative architecture, uh, build a Linux container for an alternative architecture, um, you can do. OK. Um, so that's that's a nice little thing, especially if you're like um, uh, having to build like on a Windows x86 laptop and having to build for Graviton in the cloud. You can you can do it for emulation. Uh, it's not running uh, an ARM64 kernel or a virtual machine. It's purely emulation. Right. And that's I why think Windows runs on ARM, correct? If I remember correctly, they haven't got. They do or they don't. It they does do. these days, yeah. Oh, okay. This that I've been not, used it for years. Not, not what I'm using here. Here, here is a an x86. Laptop. X86. Okay. Yeah, and and be, just to clarify something, or or maybe drive the point home. Um, like Ollie said, it's using emulation, so you wouldn't ever want to like run a container in in production, let's say, using emulation. Um, but mm -hmm. it it is very helpful to sometimes build an image for another platform or even run an image, which maybe you don't have the Docker file for to like re recreate it um, for your platform. Um, but really, this is just a convenience for, um, you know, local use and testing. Uh, so just in, just in case anybody got the wrong idea from that. <laughs> yeah. So, so Ali, we're coming on approximately 40 minutes in the show. And I think you wanted to show us some kind of developer magic of how this thing would actually work in a complete workflow. Is there something you wanted to sh share with us? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, one of the, I kind of wanted to highlight one of the cool Finch features we had last year, and I kind of, it brings it together now with, with the Windows release as well. Um, and this kind of brings a lot of the different, I guess, developer tooling technology together. Uh, but for developing applications in the cloud, uh, or de sorry, deploying applications in the cloud, a lot of people use, AWS CDK or the, the cloud development kit as it's known. And um, the CDK enables you to, it's, it basically abstracts away infrastructure as code. So you can like define full like AWS resources in CDK. So you can define like Amazon ECS services or uh, DynamoDB databases or whatever it may be in, in CDK in your favorite programming language. So kind of like abstracts or aim structures code, you can write constructs in like Python or Golang or TypeScript and, and behind the scenes, it creates infrastructure as code that would then create resources on the cloud. Um, and one of the, the things that, that you can do with CDK is that 
if you're developing or your application alongside the infrastructure as code to deploy it, um, you can kind of combine those things into the same definition file. And so um, CDK, if you if you didn't know, has this constructs uh, hub or this this construct library of, of of I guess abstracted away resources in the cloud. Um, and one of the, the cool things they have is this, this Docker image asset constructs. And this is a way that you can basically build a container image alongside the definition of your, um, your cloud resources. So kind of an example of this, which, might, which kind of might help to drive it home a little bit. Um, here I have a, um, a, a TypeScript example of CDK. And in here, I have defined like a VPC, an existing ECS cluster. I've defined my application code, and, and, and this is basically a, a link to a directory. And I've also defined a load balanced Fargate service, all in the same file. So I've defined my cloud okay. resources, I've defined my application, all, all quite quite locally. And what you can then do is 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 through CDK and Finch, build the Docker image, push it up to the registry, and deploy it all through 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 one command. And this is kind of showing like full, I guess, end-to-end uh, -end development of, of not just your application, but pairing it with, with cloud resources. Um, and so that's kind of one of, the, one of those, uh, those nice things. And um, let me just reset this file. Um, and so what uh, earlier on, I deployed this infrastructure um, into my AWS environment. So uh, through through CDK, I created a CloudFormation stack called the Finch Demo Stack, and inside of the the, the stack itself, it had a number of AWS resources, so load balancers and services and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and what you're then able to do, and which is quite nice, is is that you're then able to pair CDK with with Finch. So um, if you set an environment variable for CDK to use Finch. And so you can set uh, like CDK underscore Docker equals Finch. What you can then do is, is run your CDK commands and it would create infrastructure in the cloud as well as create your container images. And one of the commands that I really like on CDK, um, which I, I, I think is, is, is really powerful is, is CDK watch. And CDK watch uh, for those that don't know, is, is basically helping reduce the time taken for inner loop changes to be reflected in the cloud. And what it is doing is it's looking at my, my, my directory here. So you can see that it's looking for all these different files for changes. And if there are any changes, reflect them in the cloud. So if I go back to my, uh, my application here, and I change um, a line in my in my uh, HTML that, that that logo that I was playing with before. And so, if I, I don't know, call it uh, contains from the couch, contains from the couch, and ECS, and I save it. What I would expect now is for CDK to notice that there was a change, detected change, and it's now going to go away and create a new container image for me using Finch, push that container image up to the cloud, and then deploy it to ECS all, all straight away. So you can see now off, off it goes. And uh, for those that have built container images before, you're gonna, rec you're gonna recognize the, the kind of output as it goes through and, and builds everything. So there it goes, it's building my container image. And this just kind of shows nice nice end-to-end -end of Finch plugged into a CDK environment. That's actually very, very cool. Um, I really like this. And of course, this is going to take a couple of minutes until everything syncs up and deploys the, the CDK deploy. So um, this is really, really nice and unfortunately failed because Something. we're doing it live, of course, and that <laughs> always happens when it fails. 
Uh, we can try that again. I think that will, yeah. that will work again. It timed out. Uh, Always fun um, to do it live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but, we always do it live, so it's fine. It's it's <laughs> it's it's nice using um, uh, this 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 Docker image assets construct. Obviously, like for produ production rollouts, you would check in your code, you would build your container image properly. Yeah. But if you wanted to see how that change would get rolled out really really quickly, um, you can use this alongside Finch to then build and and, and deploy that image. And uh, it's going in. Fingers crossed on the second. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. So while we're waiting for this to scroll on the screen, hopefully it will work. And if it doesn't, we'll. I, I promise we will. We 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 will believe that it actually should, um, <laughs> and it does work. Um, let's talk about more or less what didn't work this time. What's that? Don't worry. Yeah, asset. I did. Uh, 255, I don't know. Something's timing out, but we'll figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the is failing for some reason. Yeah. OK. Let's talk about what's coming up in the future for, for Finch. I mean, this is we released, as you say, not so long ago, if I remember, two, three months ago, Finch 1.0. We now just released the Windows, um, Windows version for Finch as well. So what's coming further down the road? You can share with us. Yeah, it's, it's it's a great question. So, um, the the first thing I'll, I'll say on that is is Finch is is open source, and um, we're pretty transparent around what we're working on, and a lot of what we work on is driven by customer feedback. So, um, honestly, people should should go out there, use Finch on Windows, and and provide us feedback. What what works, what doesn't work, what you would like to see. What you don't like to see, feel free to create issues in the, the repo in the, in the issues column, and 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 like and then depending on who plus one is them or, or, or whatever, it helps us to prioritize um, what's happening. Um, you can see there's a nice little tag as a label for for Windows features, so you can you can plug that in. Nice. Um, this one here, and this was actually opened by me on, on launch day, is, is one of the exciting areas that, that people are asking us for and, and, and something we're going to have put quite high on our list, is the idea to um, use Finch from other distributions. All of my demonstrations today have been from a PowerShell environment, um, but I have got other WSL distributions on my machine. I have this this Ubuntu one that I develop in. And so one of the, the requests people have is the ability to, um, while in that Ubuntu environment, build and run containers through Finch. So in other words, instead of running it through PowerShell, like you run it through one of your Linux WSL environments, I can see the use of that. I kind of call it a little bit picky, but that's a different thing. But that, I mean, I can understand because people don't want, if they're already running and are used to running things in WSL and doing all their work there, then they also want to run the same thing and not exit to another shell. Okay. I can get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely like two different types of users. There's like the Windows first or Windows, like people that don't, don't even know about WSL, let's say. And then there's like Ollie said, people that already have their you know, default WSL distribution configured just the way they like it. And they still want to use Finch. Um, and we we know about that use case. Like Ollie said, we have an issue for it. If if that speaks to you, please go um, thumbs up it. Um, it's definitely high on our list. Um, but yeah, we, we cater to the first uh, use case that I was talking about. Maybe it's sort of like the, the Windows developer. Um, yep. That doesn't mean that the second use case is any is any less valid, though. Yeah. Um, then uh, apart from that, there's a, a kind of a few other, I would say, like um, paper cuts on the Windows side that we're, we're finding as we're going through. So um, there's, there's different networking modes in WSL that we want to kind of cross off, like the idea of, of, of uh, supporting NAT and Mirrored and, and a few other WSL features that we want to br bring into Finch. And there's, I guess, a lot of scope for us to 
to kind of make make Finch completely seamless on on Windows and and, and hopefully <laughs> well you would have seen in the CDK demo but like that's kind of the experience we want people to almost forget that there is this Finch VM running that is doing all of the heavy lifting for right. things. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and just to touch on that, um, WSL2 is actively developed and supported by Microsoft. They add new features all the time. So that mirrored mode networking for one, uh, for example, um, there's no reason Finch can't work with it. It just doesn't because it was so recently introduced. So that's probably going to happen, unfortunately, um, going forward. But the goal is to have Finch um, you know, as compatible with these new things as fast as possible. So nice. yeah. And for that, of course, we need your feedback, everybody who ever wants to use it, so we can understand what is more important. And as Ali said, and Justin said, thumbs up, uh, plus one, one of the issues, or open up a new one. If you really, really want to, you can also contribute the code as well. So I'm sure we'd be very happy to have contributions as well. Um, we're coming to the close of an hour. Um, are there any last things you would like to leave with everybody that's watching watching the episode today? It's actually been super interesting, even though I still hate Windows, but it was very, very interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah um, there's, there's lots of exciting things going on, on on the Finch side. So so kind of invite everybody to, to get involved, whether that's just as a, as a user and, and reporting things as they find it, or whether it's, it's for people to be more involved in the community. Um, I haven't said it yet, but we are on the CNCF Slack. Um, so there is a Finch channel on the CNCF Slack. So if you had questions or, or want to want to talk to us about different things, then you can find us there. You can pose a question there and either we'll respond or even other members in the community will respond and, and, and help you work through whatever whatever it is. Um, yeah, and, and and at the same time, like let, let us know your feedback, and not just on the Windows side as well, right? We we were we still have Finch on macOS, and 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 we're kind of still working hard on that side of things as well. There, there's a lot of, I guess, commonalities between the two. So you know, when we when we release a feature for Finch, it's normally on both channels just uh, simultaneously. But yeah, don't don't forget about Finch on macOS too. And Justin, do you have any power parting thoughts for us before we before we close out? Um, yeah, it just it would be great to hear more from the users. Um, that's really that's really my only uh, parting thought. Um, we do have issues that you know have thumbs up, but you know, given that Finch on Windows is so new, um, we're still working on that. Um, you know, prioritization and things like that. So, um, your voice matters, and it does help. Um, contribute to what gets worked on next. So, um, yeah, keep that in mind if you if you end up trying out Finch on Windows or just Finch in yeah, general. Thank you very much. And all the links are going to be um, available in the show notes on YouTube. So, if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please, as they say, smash that button and hit the subscribe button and thumbs up the the, the episode if you like the if you like the content. Also, you can subscribe to our AWS channel on Twitch, which has multiple different um, episodes and shows running pretty much throughout the day. Um, so also don't forget to check us out over there. Um, Justin and Oli, thank you very, very much for joining me today. It was absolutely awesome. Very, very interesting. Um, we're going to be back again next week, same time, same place, with another ECS episode with actually a customer spotlight. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much for joining. And thank you very much, all of our guests, which are joining us. I forgot to mention you, sorry. Giscarded and Inspector the Amateur and everybody else who chimed in on the chat. Thank you so much for joining and participating. See you all next week. <laughs>